What's going on besties? Today I am super excited because we're talking about something that I am very passionate about, which is ECGs. So of course, we can't really talk about ECGs without talking about the mechanics. So we're gonna get started with cardiac action potential and the electrical cycle. Let's get started. When we're discussing the coronary blood supply, it's crucial to recognize that our heart functions not just as a mechanical pump, but it also relies on vital supply of oxygen and electrolyte. However, beyond all of these essentials, the heart's operation is fundamentally driven by its electrical conduction system. This system is the cornerstone of initiating heart contractions, serving as that spark that activates the pump's mechanical functions. Without it, the heart cannot operate efficiently, hindering the circulation of blood throughout the body. Understanding the electrical conduction system is therefore paramount when it comes to grasping how the heart ultimately works. As we explore electrocardiograms, also known as ECGs, it's important to note that they reflect only the heart's electrical activity and it does not show any mechanical movement. Any alterations in the system's function not only affects how the heart operates, but also changes the appearance of the activity on our EKG reading. Just an important note before we move forward, you may hear the words ECG and EKG used interchangeably. Please note that they do mean the same thing. So our heart consists of specialized cells known as myocytes, which come in various types. However, the primary ones that we're gonna be interested in are those responsible for pacemaking, signal transmission, as well as contraction. The cells and the system they form play a critical role in generating the electrical impulses that lead to the contraction of cardiac muscle cells. They also guarantee that these activation signals are delivered to all parts of the heart within a suitable time frame. So let's delve into the various components of the electrical conduction system of the heart. We will begin with the internal view of the heart, which will help guide us and serve us as we trace the pathway of the conduction system. Our starting point is going to be our sinoatrial node, right up here, situated in the right atrium. It's really close to where it meets with the superior vena cava. This node is essentially the heart's primary pacemaker, marking the commencement of electrical conduction pathways. The activation of this SA node triggers the sequential contraction of atrial myocyte. It's also crucial to understand the role of that fibrous tissue of the septum. It separates the left and right sides of the heart, as well as the atria from the ventricles. This separation is vital as it hinders direct electrical signal transmission between these heart sections. Regarding blood supply, the SA node receives its blood from the right coronary artery in approximately 60% of individuals. The remainder primarily receive blood from the left coronary artery, although a minority receives perfusion from both. Following that SA node, we encounter a structure known as Bachmann's bundle. It is characterized by its ability to transmit high-speed signals extending from that SA node across that arterial septum and into our left atrium. Next up, we have the internodal pathways comprising of three separate distinct routes known as the anterior, middle, and posterior. These pathways are chiefly involved in conveying that electrical impulse from the SA node to the atrial ventricular node, also known as the AV node. Moving on, we move to the atrial ventricular node, also known as the AV node, which is also suited in that right atrium. This time, it's going to be a lot closer to that coronary sinus and the tricuspid valve. This cluster of cells is specialized to momentarily pause that electrical signal from the SA node before it proceeds to the ventricles. This intentional delay is crucial as it provides sufficient time for the atria to contract and thus ensure that those ventricles are going to be fully filled before themselves contract as well. It's noteworthy that the blood supply for the AV node comes exclusively from our right coronary artery. Following our AV node, we encounter the bundle of his, which is comprised of another group of high-speed transmission cells. These cells extend from the AV node, traversing partially through that wall of the right atrium, where it's going to encounter the interventricular septum, from where they will branch off again to both the left ventricle and the right ventricle. In individuals without cardiac abnormalities, this pathway represents the sole communication channel between the atria and the ventricles. 
As discussed, the bundle of his is going to split off into two distinct pathways. You have the right bundle branch, like you see here on your screen in brown, and you're gonna have the left bundle branch, which you see here on your screen in orange. That right bundle branch is going to transmit electrical impulses to the right ventricle that accumulates with the Purkinje fibers, which we're gonna discuss shortly. On the other hand, the left bundle branch is the second branch derived from the bundle of his and is dedicated to conveying the signal to various parts of our left ventricle. Lastly, we're gonna turn our attention to those Purkinje fibers, which project from both the right and left bundle branches and directly interface with our heart's myocytes. These fibers are essentially extensions that break off from our branch bundles. The primary role of our Purkinje fibers is to initiate depolarization within our muscle cells, triggering that contraction of the cardiac muscle. Similar to the way that atrial myocytes function, the ventricular myocytes are going to receive and further transmit that electrical signal to adjacent cells at a slower pace compared to the rapid transmission observed with our high-speed bundle branches. That summarizes the structural framework of the electrical conduction system. An essential characteristic to understand about the system is its inherent pacemaker capability of its various cells, which essentially governs the heart rate. Virtually all components of the system we've discussed possess their own intrinsic pacemaker rate. What's interesting is that these rates decrease progressively as one moves further down the system. When you think about it, this is ultimately the body's contingency plan. Should a higher pacemaker fail to initiate, a lower level pacemaker eventually is going to activate to ensure the heart's contractions continue. That SA node is going to stand as the heart's primary pacemaker, and its natural pace is going to be between 60 to 100 beats per minute, and it can adjust the rate depending on what the body's needs are. Following that sequence, the AV node is going to be our secondary pacemaker, and it's going to present with its own intrinsic rate of being between 40 and 60 beats per minute. That bundle of his and those bundle branches are also going to follow that same heart rate that we would see with our atrial ventricular node as being between 40 and 60 beats per minute. And then lastly, the Purkinje cells and those ventricular myocytes have a fallback rate between 20 and 40 beats per minute. This really is the true definition of our last ditch pacemaker. While the slower rates further down the system are not ideal and potentially life-threatening if we don't address them, they afford the body additional time for corrective measures. So let's talk about depolarization and repolarization. We discussed earlier about cardiac myocytes, which contract upon receiving electrical signals termed as action potentials. Unlike our skeletal muscles, which require neural stimulation to contract, the heart autonomously produces its own electrical impulses. What's amazing is that the heart can continue to be outside of the body, showcasing its intrinsic electrical generation capability. Myocytes are interlinked via GAT junctions, creating conduits where ions can seamlessly transfer from one cell to another. This ion exchange facilitates the electrical synchronization of adjacent cells. An action potential of one cell can induce a subsequent action potential of its neighboring cell, allowing signals to spread swiftly throughout the heart. It's important to note that pacemaker cells and contractile myocytes demonstrate distinct types of action potential, each tailored to its specific roles in the heart's function. As you can see here with our pacemaker cell, this is autoarrhythmic. So we're only seeing just a tiny little bump. But when we're looking at our contractile cells, our non-autoarrhythmic cells, we're seeing this initial high increase of voltage before ultimately coming down and falling into repolarization. So cells exhibit polarization characterized by an electrical voltage difference across the membrane. In a resting state, a cell membrane's voltage and the resting membrane potential typically have a negative value. This indicates that the interior of the cell is going to be more negatively charged compared to the exterior of the cell. During this resting phase, the cells are gonna maintain specific ion concentration gradients across the membrane. Sodium and calcium ions predominantly outside the cell, while potassium ions are gonna be more abundant inside the cell. Various pumps are gonna actively transport sodium 
and calcium out of the cell and potassium ions into the cell in order to sustain these gradients. Now what happens during an action potential is a temporary reversal of the cell's membrane's electrical polarity, triggering a voltage-gated ion channel. These channels are going to allow ions to move in and out of the cell and operate based on changes in membrane voltage, opening or closing and responding to particular membrane potential values. When that membrane voltage rises and becomes less negative, this reduction in polarization is going to be called depolarization. Conversely, an increase in that negative membrane potential is going to be referred to as repolarization. The initiation of an action potential requires the membrane voltage to depolarize to a specific critical level. This is what we call the threshold. So let's start by looking at the action potential for pacemaker cells. The SA node's pacemaker cells generate roughly 80 action potentials per minute, naturally initiating a heartbeat with each one, which leads to the average heart rate of being approximately 80 beats per minute. Unlike other cells, pacemaker cells lack a stable resting potential. Instead, their voltage begins around negative 60 millivolts and will gradually increase until it hits that negative 40 millivolts, also known as the threshold. This unique behavior is attributed to what is known as funny currents, exclusive to pacemaker cells. Funny channels are going to activate when the membrane voltage dips below negative 40 millivolts, facilitating a gradual sodium entry into our cells. This slow depolarization phase is going to be termed as the pacemaker potential. Reaching that threshold, our calcium channels are going to open, allowing calcium to come into the cell, further depolarizing the membrane. With this influx of calcium, it's going to mark the beginning of the action potential's upward trajectory. Once depolarization hits its peak, our potassium channels are going to open up and our calcium channels are going to close themselves off. This is going to lead to potassium ultimately leaving the cell and it's going to cause our voltage to drop down below negative 60 millivolts. This decrease represents the action potential's downward phase. Ionic pumps are going to work to reestablish that original gradient, setting the stage for the process to begin all over again. Now let's talk about the action potential when it comes to our contractile myocytes. Electrical signals from our SA node are going to transverse the heart's conduction system, reaching those contractile myocytes which are equipped with those distinct array of ion channels. Moreover, these cells are going to possess specialized components known as sarcoplasmic reticulum, which holds a significant reserve of calcium and are filled with myofibrils. Contractile cells are going to maintain a steady resting potential of negative 90 millivolts and only undergo that depolarization when those adjacent myocytes stimulate them. So during depolarization, the cell's interior is going to become enriched with those sodium and those calcium ions. These ions are going to move through gap junctions to a neighboring cell, ultimately elevating its membrane voltage to negative 70 millivolts, which is the threshold for our contractile myocytes. Upon reaching that threshold, fast sodium channels are going to start to activate, causing this swift influx of sodium and a rapid voltage increase. This is going to mark that depolarization phase. Additionally, L-type calcium channels are going to open up at negative 40 millivolts, allowing a gradual and more continuously slow entry of calcium. As that action potential reaches its peak, sodium channels are going to swiftly shut themselves off, while voltage-gated potassium channels are going to start to open up, allowing potassium to come out of the cell, leading to a slight drop in membrane potential, a stage we commonly refer to as early repolarization. After we enter that early depolarization, which is this little blue spot that you see here on your screen, that action potential is going to enter what we call a plateau phase. It's going to last approximately 200 milliseconds and it's distinguished by cardiac action potentials. This phase is maintained by that efflux of potassium to offset that influx of our calcium, ultimately highlighting the calcium's pivotal role in linking electrical signals to muscle contraction. 
However, that influx of calcium from outside the cell alone is not going to trigger a contraction. What it does instead is it's going to initiate a far larger calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We call this process calcium-induced calcium release, which then drives muscle contraction via those sliding filament mechanisms also seen in skeletal muscle. So ultimately contraction is going to begin midway through that plateau phase and it's going to continue until its conclusion. As those calcium channels gradually begin to close, that outflow of potassium becomes more dominant, returning that membrane voltage to its original resting state. Calcium is then actively expelled from the cell and re-sequestered back inside that sarcoplasmic reticulum. While the sodium and potassium pumps are going to start to reestablish the ionic equilibrium across the membrane. This plateau phase is going to ensure that those cardiac muscles are going to remain contracted for an extended period of time, unlike we see with skeletal muscles. It is a crucial adaption for the effective ejection of blood from the heart's chambers. Additionally, the absolute refractory period in cardiac muscle spans 250 milliseconds, significantly longer than the one millisecond duration observed in skeletal muscle. This extension of the refractory period is going to guarantee that the muscles relax fully before they can react to another stimulus. This mechanism is vital for preventing that phenomena of summation and tetanus, conditions which would ultimately impair the heart's ability to beat properly. I hope that this video was helpful in understanding the action potential and electrical conduction system of the heart. If you have any questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechunkstore.com where there's a ton of additional resources to help you understand ECGs. And as always, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye!